All right, so I think we're uh, we're getting to a bigger crowd here. So um, an official warm welcome from my end. I'm Selina Haney. I'm a policy advisor at the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, and I'm a co-chair of the, don uh, the working group of women economic empowerment at the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development. And I'm very happy to be here with my with my colleagues from this working group, um, Jillian, as well as Claudia. Um, you will get to know them later in the webinar as well. Why are we here today? Um, we wanted to understand how donors um, should adjust the programs to really ensure um, women's economic empowerment during um, the pandemic that we have lived through now almost two years. Um, as you all know, probably women unfortunately are hit harder by the economic measures of the pandemic. And we wanted to understand how we can better address this issue at hand. Um, for this, we have um, we have um, together with with two consultants, Leva and um, and um, Kate. Um, we have prepared a brief, or actually they did. Um, we asked them to do so, and they really um, went into details in understanding how donors addressed um, this issue and um, what opportunities are also there to, to come up with. And Ella just shared this policy brief um, with us in the chat box in case you have not yet seen it. I warmly um, recommend you read this, it's very insightful. Yes, um, so how will we spend the time together today? Uh, we will first test your knowledge <laughs> on the issue at hand. So now you're shocked and awake and listen. Um, and then later, um, we will listen to Kate and Leva. As I said, they're two outstanding researchers and consultants from, from FemDev. Um, and they will share some key insights from this policy brief and research they have conducted for us. Um, my colleague, uh, Jillian, from the Canada's International Development um, Research Center, she will then interview them to get a little bit more out of um, their, their research insights. And she will also lead a panel discussion with three voices from the field that we invited because we wanted to really understand um, how we can shape our donor responses um, because they're the ones receiving it. So we have invited um, from, uh, from HomeNet, Navia, and she will sh share some insights from the textile sector with us. Then we have Clara from Incluyeme, um, and we have Emma from Tiny Totos. More on, on their social business, um, et cetera, uh, later during the panel. Then um, we're ready to go um, with the real insights um, from the study with uh, Leva and, um, and Kate. So I think now it's time to listen to your insights from, from the policy brief. Over to you, Leva and Kate. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Selena, and for that fun game. Um, maybe Ella, I'll just ask if you could move to the next slide. Um, we really appreciate the chance to be part of this panel. Um, so for this work, we set out to understand, you know, what are some of the key economic risks and challenges facing women in developing regions during COVID uh, to document how donors are responding and to recommend some actions to promote we in COVID response and recovery efforts. Next slide, please. So what did we find? Well, our evidence review and key informant interviews clearly demonstrated that COVID is disproportionately affecting women and girls in developing regions. And in the brief, we highlight these seven key areas where women and girls are facing some of the most severe impacts with respect to we or women's economic empowerment. There's no time to go into detail on each area here, but I'll share just a few highlights to get us started and to set the context. So for starters, across all regions, women have been more likely than men to drop out of the labor force during the pandemic. This is due to a combination of factors, including as mentioned, the concentration of women workers and women owned enterprises in sectors of the economy hit hardest by COVID, but as well as the fact that they're more often informal uh, and have less capital and protections to help them weather economic crises. 
The pandemic is also exacerbating pre-existing gender gaps in labor force participation and earnings as women take on the bulk of increased care responsibilities at home due to lockdowns and the closure of schools and childcare centers. Economic insecurity caused by COVID is also linked to sexual and gender-based violence due to increased household tension and conflict that arises. Calls to helplines have actually increased fivefold in some countries, while survivors face reduced access to services and support. Similarly, lockdowns, clinic closures, and the reduction of health resources, or the redirection rather, of health resources to deal with COVID all make sexual and reproductive health services like abortion, contraception, and maternal care more difficult to obtain. And this matters because, I mean, it's a human rights issue, but also with respect to the economy and economics, when women can't control the number and spacing and timing of their children, this has much longer term implications for their economic opportunities and their employment prospects. So we see from the research that women and girls are facing a whole host of economic risks and challenges during COVID that could have much longer term impacts on their economic empowerment, economic security, and well-being. And with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Leva to talk more about donor responses. Thank you, Kate. Next slide, please. So what we also found in our evidence review is that for donors and development agencies responding to the gender impacts of the pandemic has generally required adjusting operations and programming, issuing new support, and contributing to global research efforts. Our research found that there was a range of ways in which organizations actually engaged with their responses to the pandemic, some explicitly outlining how they will incorporate gender into their response efforts, while others being more implicit on their gender approach. So with regards to adjusting operations and programming, what we found is that donors and development agencies adjusted their operations and programming to ensure adequate support for gender equality and we was maintained. Now this has meant adapting previous work plans to incorporate a COVID-19 response and allowing for flexibility in program delivery schedule and budgets. Now, with regards to issuing new support, our research found that governments, bilateral and multilateral donors, development banks, philanthropic organizations, and the private sector have all played an important and key role in contributing money, contributing equipment, and contributing expertise to the COVID-19 gender response. Similarly, when looking at contributing to global research efforts, what we saw was that donors and development agencies have contributed to research on the impact of COVID-19 for gender and we, with either doing a general overview papers, sector specific reports, or topical evidence reviews like we did with this policy review. In addition to written publications, many donors have utilized online platforms to share information and research, foster collaboration, and amplify the role of gender and we in the global response to COVID. This work has taken on many forms, such as webinars like this, virtual dialogues, podcasts, and informational videos. Next slide, please. Now, some of the key takeaways that came out of the research findings is the need for um, and the importance of adopting and promoting a multidimensional approach to WE. This means going beyond targeting women's economic inclusion to also address the underlying factors affecting WE, including social norms, care work, sexual and gender-based violence, and overall gender discrimination. In other words, really investing in these critically and under-addressed areas to ensure a more holistic approach is taken. Another key takeaway was the importance of sharing information and resources for promoting we during COVID-19. In other words, helping to convene virtual meetings, dialogues, and events to exchange data, to gather data, to gather evidence, and highlight good practices for promoting we. And lastly, um, one other key takeaway is um, the importance of working in partnership with local women experts, organization, and groups in developing regions to really cultivate strong and equitable partnerships and consult with them to obtain information on the gender impacts of the pandemic and to be able to prepare and support locally appropriate responses. So I'll stop there for now and I look forward to our discussion. Right. Thanks very much. Thanks, Leva. Thanks, Kate, for your for your presentation. Uh, we, as in as in DCD members, and and just a reminder, uh, Celine already mentioned this. My name is Jillian Dowie from the IDRC, and, and I'm really pleased to be part of this today. 
Um, but we, as VCD members, really appreciated the brief that you prepared and, and really using it to think through the experience of women workers in, in lower resource contexts and, and the organizations that work directly with them and how donors responded and, and needed to respond and of course need to continue responding as we go forward to the, the sort of drawn out nature of this, of this crisis. So I just have a couple of questions that, that I wanna run through with, with you to sort of get a sense of your experience of doing this work and what you found. You had a lot of interviews, you engaged with a lot of people. It'd be really great to be able to get a sense of, of you know, what, what you came away with. My first question is for either of you, both of you, uh, while you were preparing the brief, what, what surprised you most in the findings and reviews you conducted or did anything surprise you? Thanks, Jillian. I could take this one. Um, so I think at the time of the research, we were really quite surprised to observe this gap uh, between the level of mainstream attention that gender equality and we issues seem to be receiving from governments, from donors, even from the media, uh, versus the extent of actual investment and action taking place on these issues. So even in more traditional we topics like women's entrepreneurship or digital and financial inclusion, we still found these to be critical and under addressed aspects of we in COVID response and recovery efforts. So for, you know, for example, I do a lot of work on women's paid and unpaid care work. And a lot of people are saying, you know, care is having a moment right now. COVID's really shone a light on the gender inequalities in childcare and domestic work. Yet our research and research by organizations like the Center for Global Development and Oxfam have found that care work is still just remaining largely absent from COVID-19 fiscal uh, stimulus and emergency measures uh, being announced by donors. So for all the attention that these types of issues seem to be receiving, and maybe it's because we're all part of uh, a community working on this, but I really do think there was much more mainstream attention for WE than I've ever seen um, since I've been working on it. For all this attention, um, it's really not translating into the kinds of actions that we wanna see for addressing the gendered economic impacts of the crisis head on. And you know where support and relief is being provided to women, in many cases, it's not reaching those who are worse affected by the pandemic. So for example, we highlight um, responses targeting women informal workers as being a really unaddressed aspect of COVID responses. They're among the hardest hit by the pandemic, we know this, but they're also some of the hardest to reach with social and development assistance. Um, and they've been largely invisible, we found, and largely neglected in global COVID-19 responses. So I think, I mean, maybe naively or maybe not, but I think the disconnect between the level of attention that these issues seem to be receiving and, and the actual action taking place on them, the gap between these two things was really striking. And maybe just on a more positive note, I'll also mention that you know, something else that was surprising during our interviews with donors and with organizations actually implementing WE programming in developing regions, there were really interesting calls for more comprehensive services for things like childcare and, and mental health to help women cope with the incredible stress and anxiety that they're experiencing during the pandemic. And again, in more than a decade of working on WE, I think this was the first time that I'd actually heard organizations who are either funding or implementing WE programming actually talk explicitly about the importance of mental health as an aspect of WE. And so this was surprising in a, in a positive way. And I think that we really hope that this continues to be taken up really seriously, uh, even post COVID. Right, thanks so much. Yeah, that, I mean, this is part of what I found so helpful about it, which is, which is, I, I think maybe a lot of people in here might agree. We we tend to be in these boxes where we think we talk about care so much, and obviously everybody's part of that. And and then to see that that disconnect actually continues to exist, and it doesn't really go deeply into organizations, donor organizations, policy, etc. Um, it's, it's such an important reminder to our work to continue to push, to continue to make sure that those programs are relevant, continue to find those pieces of those entry points where we can actually make a difference. So that's. That was really important. I, I, you're so right, because I should add that it's it's everyone we spoke to cared about these issues, like all of yeah. the donor agencies, all of the partners that are implementing this work on the ground are so passionate about this. And I think maybe that's where we were so surprised at the disconnect, because 
there seemed to be this newfound level of urgency and attention taking place. And then when we actually looked at the data coming out of organizations like UNDP and UND, UN Women and others, we see that this isn't translating into resources and investment in action. So yeah, I think it was a bit surprising. Like you said, we kind of when we run in these circles uh, and we only talk to each other, sometimes we can, you know, not understand. Um, we can't see the bigger picture. And so yeah, that that was definitely surprising. I think you've put that well. Thanks. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna talk at the end of this about ways forward, but let's make note of that, everybody, because this is a clear way forward. Uh, but but on a more positive note, you did end on a more positive note, but um, bringing all together, bringing together all of this information, having all these interviews, did you come across anything that was particularly inspiring to you? Or is there anything that you have, have taken and applied in your work as consultants in your gender focused work? How, how, has that, how has that been since? Thanks, Jillian. I'll jump in here. So there are actually many stories and examples that we found inspiring. And I think that's why Kate and I love doing this work and love speaking to different people in um, different stakeholders at different levels because of the stories that were shared. And so two interesting examples that I would like to draw on, which kind of emerged from our research and shows really how donors and implementing organizations have responded to COVID in kind of more innovative ways and really have adapted their approach um, are the cases of Kidogo and WIN, um, the Kidogo and WIN program. And so for those who are aware, Kidogo is a social enterprise that focuses on improving access to quality and affordable childcare in East Africa's low-income uh, low communities. And so they use a social franchising approach to really identify, train, and support women who they call mama nurs to start um, or grow their childcare micro-businesses. So in our conversations with Kidogo, um, they mentioned that in response to COVID-19 and the mandatory shutdown of childcare center, centers, Kidogo actually adapted their program approach to support vulnerable children and families in, um, by really launching what they call the Digital Caregiver Initiative that works through various digital platforms. So they heavily relied on, on text messaging, on WhatsApp, on Facebook to provide information, to provide reminders and really directly support women um, and, and caregivers during this difficult time. And so the content of their, their text messages and WhatsApp messages were also broadcasted on community radio stations to reach kind of this wider audience. They were using the tools that they had in their community to really try to adapt um, their ongoing approach and also like reach a wider participation and wider community engagement. So they actually created what they call play packs, which contain guidance and activities to create kind of a safe and stimulating environment because what they found was now that mothers were home, they had their children um, with them and they didn't know how to engage with them while everything was locked down. And so they actually distributed 61,000 at the time of the policy review, um, 61,000 play packs to these women to be able to kind of stimulate um, their children's education. And so it was really, really interesting. They were, they were using tools that they already had access to and to create kind of innovative approaches. Another interesting example that um, we found was the Women in Business program, which is a five-year program run by TechnoServe in Mozambique. And they work to facilitate um, the development of market solutions for low-income entrepreneurial women in, publishing, in a partnership with the public and private sector. So in response to COVID-19, WIN actually adopted this multi-dimensional approach, which we were mentioning earlier, to support its women partners on the ground in Mozambique. So they also used various online channels and um, they shared information and resources with partners on how to minimize the impact of COVID-19 on economic um, activities. Now, what was really inspiring in the case of WIN was that they developed this innovative um, media content to provide both information and inspiration for women entrepreneurs, um, including on the gender and social norms barriers that they face and, um, and exacerbated during the crisis. So they um, sponsored a radio novella called Jeanette, which is about a fictitious woman entrepreneur who encounters all these problems and overcomes these various challenges to her business, including a global pandemic. So this content was actually translated into several local languages and then uh, was being converted to um, social format to again, reach a wider audience. So what was interesting about these two, two cases was that they both found ways to, again, take a more local approach, but also to guide them to overcome the barriers to the pandemic. 
And uh, for those who are interested, I would completely recommend that you check out our We Talks podcast uh, because we actually do interview um, the, the key stakeholders that shared this experience. So I'm going to put in a plug for the We Talks podcast um, for you to be more inspired and learn more about these these specific cases. Right. Thanks so much, Leva. I was also about to say you should everybody should listen to the We Talks <laughs> podcast because you're going to hear more about this and some other exciting examples. I think that's 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 excellent. I mean, some of these 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 examples are are great and looking at how to use these digital tools in a way that's sort of accessible and realistic I think is super important in the context of having everything closed down in the way that it was. Um, I'm going to ask one last question to, to both or either of you if you want to give me like a quick reflection on on what what were the most urgent topics that came through where where was was there the most need for action what's your your take on that? I'll jump in quickly and I'll let Please. Kate um, if, jump in if she wants to. And she mentioned it really beautifully and really Maybe. beautifully. Uh, unpaid care work continues to be a huge, urgent, and critically underaddressed um, um, topic. And we found that time and time again, like throughout all our interviews, whether it was in the education sector, whether it was in with informal workers, it always came through that this focus needs to be on this double burden experienced by women. And, and um, and similarly, again, with regards to informal sector workers, you know, we saw the, the poll at the beginning, this amount of um, informal sectors that are actually in the sectors that are hardest hit by the pandemic, and therefore they are um, relatively have high exposure to the virus, their precarious employment status, their lack of social and labor protections further exacerbate the inequalities that they experience. And they are the hardest to reach with regards to social development um, assistance. And as Kate mentioned, are often not visible in the sectors that we're working in. And so the policy review really kind of outlined how donors can be supporting these two urgent topics with regards to care work and informal sectors. But one another interesting urgent topic that developed was as you know, we're talking about digital and financial inclusion, we saw in our interviews that more and more programs because of the lockdowns were moving um, and supporting women to move into the e commerce network and how to take their local businesses into the e commerce um, space. However, this again, adds an additional layer of barriers when we're talking digital inclusion and for those who don't have access and are being encouraged to move into the e-commerce space. So how can donors really support the digital divide gap and as well as the capacity and um, training required for entrepreneurs to be able to actually maximize in that space? So I'll leave it at that and I'll let Kate jump in if um, you'd like. I'll just say, if you're interested in knowing more, you can definitely read the policy brief. <laughs> Great, great. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Leva, Kay, for sharing for sharing your work and your insights with us. We'll come back to you again soon with questions that have come up or will continue to come up from the audience. And, and remember, everyone listening, if you, if you do have questions, you can put them in the Q&A box. And we have saved time to take a few of those at the end. So we will come back to get a little bit more insight. Um, but for now, I'm going to introduce our panelists who are who are here to, to bring us a perspective from, or I'll give you a quick round Sorry, but I'll give you a quick round of introduction uh, right now. Clara Popeo is first, is the regional project manager of Incluyame.com, a social enterprise that connects people with disabilities to job openings at corporations and, and works with companies to build inclusive and equitable workplaces across Latin America. We're also joined by Navia D'Souza, uh, Regional Coordinator of HomeNet South Asia, which is a regional network of home-based worker organizations working with informal women workers who carry out activities for a number of industries uh, from their homes, including garments and textiles. Um, and, and finally, we have Emma Caddy, the founder of Tiny Totos, a Kenyan social enterprise that works to transform the quality of preschool childcare services available to working mothers in Nairobi by helping transform informal babysitters into profitable childcare entrepreneurs. Welcome, and, and thanks to all of you for joining us and, and, and being willing to share your expertise today. I'm gonna ask, each of you first to share briefly about the experience of your organization and the women you work with during the pandemic. What were, first, what were the main challenges for the women in your networks? And the second part is, is what were the main challenges of your own organization or for your own organization to respond to those needs? Um, let's start with Clara. Clara, if you're there, can you go ahead? Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian, for the invitation to show what Inclusion is doing regarding women with disabilities. 
As you said, Incluyeme is a social company that works for social and labor inclusion of people with disabilities in 10 countries in Latin America. And 75% of people with disabilities in Latin America are currently unemployed. And they also face extra barriers to access education and health treatments. And these barriers increase if we think about women or other genders that are usually left behind. So to talk about the main challenges for women with disabilities during the pandemic, in July 2020, we ran a survey that showed that in Latin America, one in five people with disabilities had lost their jobs for reasons related to the pandemic. And this means that in these countries, this was, there was a higher loss of jobs among people with disabilities than among people without disabilities. And as I was saying, in general, people with disabilities face barriers to accessing, access, in accessing the labor market. And they also occupy precarious jobs and they work in informal conditions in several times. So they were the first to suffer the negative economic consequences of the pandemic. Another important point to mention is that people with disabilities is considered COVID risk population. So many of them decided to quit or, or to give up looking for a, for a job instead of risking their lives. And to think about specifically about women with disabilities, in interviews that we, we maintain with women with disabilities, many of them mentioned that they left their studies or their jobs because they didn't have an available computer or proper Wi-Fi connection at home. And in some cases, they decided to prioritize the use of computers or internet over the higher earning family member or their children to, to study. So they decided to quit to, or to stop studying, right? So in October, 2020, we started a project funded by PESLA and the Field Consulting to offer online training to people with disabilities in digital skills in order to improve their chances to get a job. And we started with a pilot trial of 40 people with disabilities in full stack development. And we obtained a lot of lessons learned from, from that small project and a lot of interest from companies that are interested in hiring uh, people with disabilities and supporting these kind of initiatives. So in 2021, we decided to go even further and to train 1,160 people with disabilities. And that year was the first time that we set uh, a specific percentage of women that we wanted to achieve. And we achieved a 53% of women with disabilities participating in the courses. For us, it was a huge challenge to reach women with disabilities interested in technology. But uh, we were confident that since the pandemic, a lot of companies are looking to hire people with this kind of skills and are open to home office. That is an advantage for many people with disabilities, especially in countries where we are, where physical accessibility is still a work in progress. Uh, so after this project, we realized the challenges in the intersectionality between gender and disability. And because of this, we applied for a Google grant for women economic empowerment. And this year in 2022, we are receiving a grant for Google Org with support of Vital Voices to train 600 women with disabilities in digital skills in order to improve their employability and their chances to get an employment, an employer or, or, to, yes, or to obtain an income. And we will also receive support from PESATAM to make a diagnosis to understand better these barriers or, or difficulties specific of women with disabilities in technology, because it's a group that is very invisibilized and there's no much information about them. So we are starting this, this gender lens work uh, since our experience from last year. Great, thanks very much. We actually, one of the pre-registration questions we received was about taking an intersectional lens and, and what do those solutions look like? So I think you've just answered that. I mean, looking at, at persons with disabilities, women with disabilities and the particular set of challenges mm -hmm. and how to respond to them, I think is that's a super valuable contribution to this and, and, and really great to hear. Thank you. Um, Thank you now yeah. let's turn over to, to Navia from HomeNet. Uh, thank you so much, Julie, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, so my name is Navya, I'm the Regional Coordinator at HomeNet South Asia. We are a network of home-based worker organizations across eight countries in this region. 
Uh, we represent over 900,000 worker voices, 95% uh, of which are women. Um, in 2020, in early 2020, when COVID-19 became a reality in South Asia and many parts of the world, uh, we noticed that uh, women home-based workers were one of the first to be hit and one of the hardest to be hit. But the thing about women home-based workers is that they are a hidden workforce. They're largely invisible. Uh, they're not included in government programs. They're not recognized by governments as workers. They're not in included in labor statistics. Um, and they're also not recognized by uh, many employers as workers. Uh, so you saw millions of workers you know, being hard hit, but there was absolutely no evidence, no documentation of the experience that they were going through. Uh, at this juncture, what we did at uh, HomeNet South Asia in partnership with IDRC, uh, we undertook the first kind of, it's one of a kind of study uh, to document the impact of COVID-19 on women home-based workers in South Asia. And what we have found, this has been a two-year study uh, that has interviewed close to 450 women home-based workers across seven countries and 12 locations. And what we have found through the course of this two-year study pretty much resonates through this policy proof brief that you presented to us earlier uh, on during this program. Uh, the biggest impact, of course, has been on their work and their earnings and therefore their economic empowerment. Um, in During peak lockdown in around April 2020, we saw that 69% of these women home-based workers had no access to work. And that means zero days of work. Uh, about in a, around August, 2020, the situation had improved, but then you've seen you know, multiple waves of the virus come in and then ensuing lockdowns and restrictions. And even in August, 2021, 40, over 40% of women home-based workers had simply no access to work. Those who did have access to work, however, reported that they were working for fewer hours, they were working for fewer days, and they were uh, working for a lot less money. In, uh, in all of the locations that you know, women were interviewed, none of them said that you know, our earnings in August 2021 match our pre-corona earnings. And that's quite telling because in South Asia, uh, women home-based workers, largely vulnerable women home-based workers, largely do not even match, uh, you know, um, uh, minimum wage standards even before Corona hit. So you have, you know, uh, that entire economic empowerment that has completely been de diminished by the pandemic. Uh, what we probably didn't see, and two aspects that came out you know, uh, in the report that didn't quite come out in the policy brief is diminished earnings have meant that a lot of workers are going hungry and their families are going hungry. Um, many are saying that they are skipping meals uh, and many are saying that when they do eat, their food is not as nutritious as, as it used to be before. The second and the most alarming trend that is coming up is indebtedness. Um, in a city like Mumbai, India, workers are reporting indebtedness of 651% of their annual income. And that is not something that vulnerable workers and their families can overcome without support. Why are they borrowing? Why are they borrowing money? Largely because they want to eat. They want you know, food on the table, they're borrowing for food. And they are borrowing for food largely because governments and even private aid has disappeared around these themes. In the second year of the pandemic, you saw that a lot of the relief and a lot of COVID-19 res response is now directed largely towards vaccination drives and not towards ensuring that people have food to eat, that people have work and all of those basic necessities that their rent is paid for, that their utilities bills are covered. All of these have gone missing. And therefore, you have workers, vulnerable workers, you know, pushing, uh, walking towards a poverty trap that they have probably just emerged from uh, because there is absolutely no support. In this huge gap, I think, 
you know, since we have to do high, I like the positives. The huge gap has, is being filled by worker representative organizations, trade unions, producer companies who are ensuring that, you know, they get the aid wherever it is available, that they are including in, included in any social protection programs that are launched by the government, uh, that they have access to work. Uh, you know, a, we also, um, in the first year of the pandemic, a lot of home-based worker enterprises kind of reimagined in their supply chains and went into pro producing PPE kits and masks so that workers had access to work during that time. Um, and also, you know, uh, upskilling the workers in, you know, digital, uh, digital skills um, and also ensuring that they are vaccinated. So all of these things are being met by representative organizations. However, the pandemic has been relentless. It's the third year now and uh, organizations themselves are fairly stretched and without, you know, adequate support from governments and donor agencies, you will not just see, you know, the erosion of the economic empowerment of women home-based workers, but also of future generations. Yeah, I'll stop at that. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Navya. And as a, as a plug, I'm more familiar with this work. Um, HomeNet has done an amazing job of gathering really invaluable data and information about the experience of these workers and it's available line and I, I direct everybody to go read those reports because it's it's just such a wealth of, of information that otherwise typically doesn't exist in these, in these situations. So, so kudos for, for all of that that's, that's gone into it. Um, so thank you. And now let's go to, to Emma for the same challenges for women and, and challenges for your organization. Emma, are you are you back online? Hey, yep. No. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> so I'll try to speak slowly in case uh, you lose me along the way. Um, I think I'm going to echo a lot of the previous uh, speakers' experiences of uh, how women have fared during this pandemic. Uh, as you said in the introduction, Tiny Totos works with women entrepreneurs who provide childcare. Uh, services in the lower income settlements, there's probably 4,000 who provide that on a daily basis in uh, Nairobi because there is no uh, provision of care and uh, from the state or the private sector doesn't see return in that space. So for us, the departure has always been uh, taking it at a market kind of value, like if people are paying in for the service and providing it, how can we stabilize it? Uh, by ensuring that the child care providers can sustain themselves through thick and thin, which was a good basis to have in place when the pandemic struck, because we did have fairly strong, resilient entrepreneurs uh, in place. And uh, I can get into the positive, but I will start with the negative, because it's always nicer to end on the positive than uh, end on the negative. Um, I think what we saw during the pandemic was a, a very brief closure of some of these uh, child care centers, but a week or two, because the reality was no one could afford to stay at home locked up because they needed to eat. So if child care is seen as a barometer of women's work, I will not you know, go and pay for someone to look after my child. If I'm sitting at home, I will only do it if I have somewhere to go and I'm gonna earn some money from that uh, experience, then we could see um, that they could not stay closed, even though the government had mandated that schools be closed, this gray area of childcare enabled them uh, to continue to be open, but the numbers were very different. We're also a very data-driven organization and have been tracking, you know, health, income, um, attendance figures for about six years now. So we were pretty, it's, it's pretty clear to us looking at how 2019, how the businesses in our network were performing in 2019 versus 2020 to 21, that there was, they fell off a cliff basically in, in, 20, in 2020, we saw revenues go down by about 43%. Um, attendance as well was going, you know, numbers of children there, average maybe was 25, went down to 15 or 12. I think it went down to 12. Um, we've seen the recovery back to 15 last year, a slight recovery of 15% you know, um, from 2020 to 21, but we're still talking about 30% less earnings on average. Uh, for the different businesses um, than they were having in 2019. So that not only care as an economic pursuit is a struggle, but it also 
indicates the fact that women are not able to pay for child care and does that mean that they're taking children to work does that mean that older children are looking after them does it mean that they have no work at all um, all of those factors are are are, are uh, playing playing a part um, but if we look at the you know at the positive side again probably only five percent of the businesses actually completely shut down and in some cases those decided to go up country and spend the rest of their time in the pandemic as you know as women looking after children for other women you know they're very resilient seriously resilient and i think that's where when we talk about where do, do people invest their energies and and in, in, in efforts and funds um, you just look at what uh, these women were able to do during that period. We began a loan scheme, but we already had a loan scheme before we made it a little bit more attractive um, during COVID. And we thought diversification uh, was a key thing for women to survive. I do childcare, but also sell some uh, food. I'll also, um, you know, do some sort of other kind of, um, you know, cooked meals, do egg warming. There was a lot of little micro businesses that sprung up from these uh, child care centers. Uh, they earned commissions on selling clean cook stoves. Uh, they were looking for as many different ways that they could um, to be able to make ends meet. We, we, we began to experiment to see if they could sell learning packs into the neighborhoods. They've sold about 2,500 at, you know, at profit. Um, so women's resilience is quite incredible. And for us, that has been um, one of the key lessons. And I think also, you know, the experience that I think everyone has had of being more digitally uh, enabled and being able to provide a lot of the support uh, more remotely than before um, showed that actually it was probably the best way to go about it. Um, rather than take a two hands-on charitable type of approach, you really plug into that entrepreneurship potential catalyze uh, the earning drive of women on the ground, the women who provide that child care service want to earn a living. Um, they're not doing it as a community service. They're doing it because that's how they want to pay for their own bills. And the women who are leaving their children there are doing that as well. If they begin to see this as a one-stop shop for not just child care, but nutritional needs, maybe some of the cooking needs and other aspects of their daily life that they struggle with microfinance and, and the rest, then that is is an extremely powerful community hub uh, and an and existing social network that people that we can tap into to multiply the effect of, of you know investment and and stimulus um, not just at the broad macroeconomic level but the micro micro level as well and uh, I'd arguably say that's where the greatest benefits are are derived for the for the most people we started a community enterprise and go up. Great, thanks so much. I, I think that that's, that's a very important sort of angle to bring into this as well. We talk a lot about care and women's, women's you know, responsibility for childcare and unpaid work at the house, but also remembering caregivers as workers and their own ability to sort of navigate this pandemic and care enterprises and you know their 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 essential provision during this time. I think that's a really important thing to to remember. And you're you're absolutely right. There's a lot of common experiences across your organizations, across the women that 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 all of you work with, even in all of their diversity. And I think it aligns well with what Kate and Leva found in their research as well. Um, so next, I'd like to hear everybody's views on the way forward. We've heard, I think this will be the main question we get from everybody. We've heard the idea floated a lot, build back better. Um, but what does that mean in your sector? How do we how do we foster greater resilience for women and, and, and organizations? Um, and maybe I'll, I'll stick with you, Emma, because your internet's really good right now. So let's let's kind of carry this on and, and let you answer that question first. Thanks. As you're asking that, I was like, goodness, I've I've answered half of it already. What is she? Yeah. <laughs> but I think yeah, building on on what I was saying earlier one of the reasons and i said actually at the beginning of the uh my introduction that uh the private sector by and large does not see a return to invest in low income child care and they're actually right they they are right uh you cannot necessarily as an investor as you would in a higher income na neighborhood or demographic set up a, a series of schools own them run them and pay investors back 
I, I think that's uh, unrealistic and it would probably kind of squeeze blood from a stone. I think if we look at it differently, that these women, if they are given the tools to run their daycares as best as any small business could with the, you know, the, the, the technical knowledge, access to capital and network that any small business needs to succeed. And that we recognize that daycare, childcare is a it's quite fluctuating. I mean, there's holidays, there's, you know, we're having an election coming up this year. There's gonna be periods where the daycare will have few people, few customers. And so how do you build resilience so that you avoid either subsidy like on core operating costs like you do not want a model in which the core rent and and primary bills are going to have to be met by someone else or those doors are going to shut down and yet you know it's not necessarily easy to do so you know our, our approach has been to invest in a kitchen so that revenues are 25 percent from food not just from child care they bundle well together so what other ways can you do that? And, and I think in the digital age, having a lot of women who, well, in our case, we track through kind of mobile payments and, and, and through our own custom built map, we know how they're spending, how often they're attending visit a quite an invisible demographic that one can get an insight on. So there's a lot of opportunities there, not necessarily investing in childcare, but if you can aggregate, which is a, a common need, childcare is a common need and women need it everywhere. If you can look at it that way and think, how can we get all women uh, under a certain you know, age with a certain age bearing child um, kind of demographic with a certain income caring and, and networked into this and getting additional resources, more resources, because they have, are in that space, not less. Um, and then, you know, get the digital, the Johnson and Johnson's, the Unilever's, the funders to say, there's a different way for us to build up uh, economic development that doesn't have a charitable lens. It's actually helping these pre-existing networks have the dignity that they really deserve. And, and that's why in the introduction, you say, taking them from beneficiaries to businesswomen. Or like stop thinking about them as beneficiaries because you kind of undermine what what the strength of, of 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 women who can get by with very very little and still are i'm not undermining the challenges but i am trying to give a, a glimpse to to the direction i think that people should perhaps go in um that i think is more constructive and, and ultimately empowering from the community enterprise upwards Great, thanks. No, that's that's really great. We've been we've been grappling with a lot of this thinking as well about sort of the role of investors in care enterprises and things like that. And I think this is a, a really excellent perspective to bring in. Thank you. Um, now let's go to to Navia. What do you, what do you think about you know in in the sector you work in, fostering greater resilience for women, building back better? What does that look like? Um, I think on top of my list is the is the word that you know donors don't want to hear and it's basically organizing uh, we need a lot of support towards organizing at this point because what we have seen in the past two years is that if you are not um, if the woman home-based worker was not part of a representative organization she didn't do as you know she, she the, the the survival rate is just not there you know there, there is they can't there is nothing to fall back on and these organizations provide that safety net when everything else has gone completely missing. So I think investments in organizing are key, especially across South Asia, where millions of home-based, you know, there are millions of home-based workers. The second is research. You know, there are, there's a lot of talk about increase in care work. There's a lot of talk about increase in violence. And we have seen anecdotal evidence of it, but there is no evidence. And whenever you go to advocate for these things, for programs for these things, everybody asks for evidence. And this is an this is the perfect time to build, you know, to invest in research, to build the data, and to see the contribution of women home-based workers um, in care work and also how they suffer uh, when you know they face violence at home and at their workplace. Uh, the third is the support to home-based worker enterprises. Uh, unfortunately, if you want to build back better, we actually have to see an entire rehaul of our economic structures, because right now they are simply not working for 
the, the ones who are at the bottom of the pyramid. So you want to see a rehaul of the economic structures. You want to see that, you know, buyers buy from home-based worker enterprises and not a Zara, then you will have to make major investments towards sustaining and establishing these worker enterprises and ensure that they survive in the long run. Uh, upskilling, digital, you know, all of these things about e uh, marketing on e-commerce platforms has come up in the past two years. But you will see even in South Asia where these models are fairly advanced, uh, you know, their ventures into these space are fairly nascent. So you will need, a, they will need a lot of handholding to kind of crack this entire e-commerce platforms and digital marketing eco space that is there. So investments are needed there. And finally, I think advocacy, recognizing these workers are workers. And as Emma pointed out, these are not beneficiaries. These are workers and they have worker entitlements and it's high time we recognize that if we want to build that better. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was that's that's excellent. I, I couldn't agree more. Understanding understanding the contribution of, of workers as as exactly what it is work and and supporting their enterprises and and finding different ways to to create an economic system that really does recognize and see the labor and, and the work that they're doing. I think this, these are essential considerations that we need to take on going forward. And and finally, let's turn to to Clara from Incluya May. What's what's your perspective on this on on the build back better idea? Well, I highlighted three points. Uh, the first one, I think it is to visualize different realities among women, especially women with disabilities and think about other intersectionalities and other different layers. For example, a woman that has a disability and is older than 50 years old and she's looking for a job, she will face additional barriers and it's not all the same. I think the, the intersectionality view, it's, it's very important now that, that gender is, is highlighting, right? And in the same point, I think we have to create data. To visualize means that it's also to create data to understand better different realities, right? The second one is that I believe that it is necessary to continue to work with companies in the culture of diversity and inclusion so that they hire more vulnerable, vulnerable people, especially people with disabilities, women with disabilities, and keep on pushing for home of the jobs or mixed scenarios uh, that could help people with disabilities in countries where still physical accessibility is a problem. And the last one that I think it is important to mention is that in Latin America, we still have a big problem with digital accessibility and digital literacy. And it is important to visualize this problem and to demand it from government. It is important for the future work skills that are needed and the women participation in tech is increasing and we want women with disabilities be part of that. So I think it, intersectionality work with, with, to visualize it and to work with companies would be, would be the way. Right. Sorry, I think my, my internet cut out right at the end there, but I just uh, just a, a, an absolute, you know, thank you so much for that. And I, I, you know, from a research based organization, absolutely, the data is not there and it needs to be and we need to do more to to make that more visible for sure. This is I think this is this has been really valuable insight and I'm sure everyone online is, is sort of taking this on board, I hope, and thinking about how we develop and and support programming going forward, really focusing on, on resilience, transforming power dynamics and, and making a much more inclusive and, and care-based society. Um, now we've got about 15 minutes, 10, 10, 10, 15 minutes or so for, for questions from the audience. So do you know put them in the Q&A box. But first I wanna ask Kate and Aleva to, to rejoin us, turn on your cameras um, and start by, by asking them to share, share your own insights into this discussion. What, what do you both take away from the reflections of our panelists? How did that align with your, with your findings? What, what are these forward looking agendas that, that you're envisioning as well? Kate, Leva, whoever wants to start. I can go first. I've been like nodding vigorously with my camera off this whole time. Um, just maybe a couple of comments and reflections. First, 
Uh, Claire's comments on the impact of the pandemic for women with disabilities and the work they're doing is so important. And it's also a clear gap in, in the brief, I have to admit. And, you know, when we call for intersectional analysis and approaches to the pandemic, this is exactly the type of work that is so urgent and needed. Uh, Navia's comments about the impacts of the pandemic on home-based workers and the important work that HomeNet's doing to document that speaks to, you know, what we're discussing here around the importance of strengthening the production, dissemination, and use of data on the gender impacts of the pandemic, especially in low-income countries and in the informal sector where there's so much less information available. Um, and then Emma's comments regarding the approach that uh, Tiny Totos has taken, I think really further validates something that I, even, I can't quite recall if we mentioned this in the brief or not, but we definitely need to be talking not just about the unpaid care work that women are, you know, that they the growth or the substantial increase in unpaid care work that women uh, are dealing with, but also the impacts of the pandemic on paid care workers. Um, paid care work is even further marginalized in global COVID responses and in we programming in general compared to be to work that's being done on unpaid care. And so I think that that was a really important um, point to highlight. Um, very quickly in terms of where we go forward. Um, yeah, I think building the data and evidence base, both on the impacts as well as the kinds of solutions that actually work at scale to address these challenges in an intersectional way. Uh, funding advocacy work, I think, is something that donors could really do. And Navia mentioned that includes funding for collective organizing of women workers, unions, and groups. Uh, something that I personally struggle with, but I know is really important is the need to be able to make the business case for investing in women's economic empowerment. I think a lot of us are, you know, do this work because we care so much about the, the rights you know, aspect of it, the gender equality aspect of it. But I've learned over time that in order to get, especially governments to care about this, you really have to show why it's a wise economic investment to care about this as well. And so as frustrating as that makes me, I think it's some of the most challenging and important work uh, to do in order to move that kind of, you know, to, to more align the level of attention that we're seeing to the actual action and investment in this area. Great, thanks so much, Kate. Um, so we've got, we did get quite a few questions uh, online in the registration phase and, and coming in now. So I'm gonna start with one that we got that was submitted earlier. So we make sure that we kind of get to that um, early on, which is actually, a, it's a combination of a couple of questions. And I think super relevant to the discussion we've already had, but taking a close look at, at reaching informal workers. What are the best practices to reaching out to informal workers and how can we best protect their jobs? Um, I welcome anyone to, to answer the question. I don't know if Nadia, you wanna start given the direct focus on informal workers and give you know, Claire and Emma a moment to think about how that, that resonates with their work. Sure, so sorry, I think I had a little bit of trouble with my mic. I think the best way is to actually, first of all, register them. Uh, you know, right now, when there were, you know, government, there was there was government outreach during the pandemic. There were no numbers. There's no registry of a lot of sectors of formal uh, workers, especially women home ba home based workers. Um, at a time like this. It, it's very, very important to register these workers and to actually build databases um, of these workers. Uh, once built, you kind of need to kind of devise targeted programs that address their needs. Uh, for example, India right now is registering all its informal workers under the Ishram portal. But what are the social security benefits that are going to come out of these? It's not, you know, it's everything is very, very hazy. So reaching out to them is very, very, you know, uh, registering them is very important. And I think second of all, working with uh, worker organizations at this point becomes very important because governments are going into this very blind. Uh, if they're going to make a plan for resilience, as far as they are showing in most parts of South Asia, they're only, they can only see big businesses in front of them. 
they, they can't see the, you know, the informal sector workers, the women home-based workers. So I think to kind of, you know, broaden their horizon and to ensure that everybody gets a seat at the table, it's very, very important to work very closely with uh, representative organizations um, uh, and ensure that, you know, they're accounted for. So I think these two would be at the top of my list. Great, thanks so much. Um, Emma, Clara, Kate, Leva, anybody else wanna, wanna chime in on this? Yeah, I just wanted to touch on that and also the Kate's earlier point around making Thanks. the business case. Um, we were involved uh, over the last year with a, a study on this, trying to make the same case with uh, UNICEF and Palladium in, in Rwanda. So there's been a, a real struggle to get women um, able to work as productively as they would like to in the fields, in the agricultural fields, because they have the competing childcare needs. And, and some companies have begun to set up childcare centers and some have thought, well, I don't really know, it's very CSR, so should I really bother to do this? Um, so we went in uh, as a team with Penny Todos from the childcare um, economic kind of perspective and then um, another set of people looking at market change and so forth and ultimately the study revealed that for those companies that had set up child care centers and had sufficient coverage women were plucking 34 percent more tea a month and they're actually working a day or two less uh, and they were ultimately generating for one particular company thirty four thousand dollars more in revenue um, the child care center had cost about 30000 to set up and was probably operating cost 6000 a year. So pretty much exactly the amount that had been invested in that year was generated back. Um, that was the optimum one. Most of the payback periods would be more like an 18 months to 24 months uh, trajectory. But this, this report is, is publicly available through UNICEF Rwanda's site. Uh, and ultimately, we made the business case and we launched this in October last year with the you know, ministry and, and all the development agencies and everyone's very excited. And now we're working on a blueprint to help, okay, ultimately to help companies to know how to actually do what they inadvertently had kind of done, but they probably could have done more efficiently had they been motivated at the board level by the fact that women, women need, childcare really pays off. Uh, and, and we should actually invest in it, maybe a longer term payback, but we will get there in the end. Um, so I think there are more, there are opportunities to make the business case. Again, like I said earlier, it's not necessarily returns from childcare, but it's returns from other things that women can now do when that is liberated. So the return is not as neat as an investor wants to see. I put it in this and I get the return from the same economy. We've got to blend uh, a few different functions, but ultimately with it, holistic view on life, which is what most women and mothers have, uh, I think it's very possible to craft those messages. We just have to look at it a bit differently. Great, thanks. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree about how we, we do have to reshape the way we see kind of how the economy interacts and, and where we place value within that. I think that's really important. Um, Clara, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to share about the informal worker piece, but I might add a second question for you if you do. Um, that we got in the chat, which, because you, you'd already kind of mentioned a few successes over the last couple of years and, and, and the way that you've grown. But one of the questions is, how do we move the, how do we move the needle from discussion to appropriate action by all stakeholders? In your experience, how do you, how do you make that kind of progress, um, as well as questions about how, if you, if your organization reaches informal workers and how you do that? Thanks. Thank you. Well, I can't agree more with, with the, the previous uh, speakers. Uh, I think it is very related to creating data and visualize different groups and realities and these intersectionalities. I, I, I will insist on it because I think it is, a, it is <clears throat> a completely necessary. And if, you, if we want to, to share this information and this necessity and this urgency, we need data to convince and to share this reality. Uh, in Cluyme, we have 220,000 people with disabilities registered to get a job. And this is because, in general, they don't find a job in the traditional ways that people without disabilities uh, do to, to get a job. 
So this is the way we find to connect them with companies. We work with 500 companies with, in different sites and different uh, activities to work with them in the culture of diversity and inclusion and to insist in the importance to have more diverse uh, teams and the, the talent of people with disabilities that is available in these people and in our database and the, the people that is registered in our in our site. So I think we can work, we can provide them or offer them better jobs, better conditions, but for that it is necessary to join the companies to make them participate and, and tell us what they need, what with, which skills they are needing uh, to connect these two parts, right? And yes, I think this is uh, related to the business that we were talking about. And what was the other question? Ah, the, the informal. Yes, I think I, I already mentioned it. Yes. Great. Thanks so much. I So I, I'm conscious of the time. We really need to, to wrap up, but I want to give anyone else, you know, a last opportunity. If you have something really to share about, you know, how to move the needle, how to make that kind of push towards impact. If anybody wants to jump in and, and share for one minute, I, I'm happy to, to happy to hear it. No, okay. Then, uh, then I think we will we will wrap it up here to keep time. We there were a couple of other questions, some interesting things about linking to women's peace and security and things like that that we haven't been able to get to. Um, but we can try our best to figure out how to do that after the fact. But for now, I'm going to thank Kate, Leva, Navia, Clara, Emma once again for your time uh, today. This was a really great discussion, and I, I really appreciate the the forward looking priorities that you've that you've laid out. I feel really energized from this. Then I'm gonna hand it back over to Selena now to close up. Thanks very much. Thank you everyone also from, from my side. Um, I'm really impressed as well. Um, so, so insightful um, stories and experiences really from, from the field and from, from um, very professional researchers. So I think, I hope that all our participants um, listening to this webinar um, we're able to, yeah, take a lot out, out of it. Um, what I take out of it, I think, um, I mean, you cannot really summarize this um, richness in a nutshell, but um, what really came out for me is the valuing um, of, of the contribution of, of everyone and, and not just in an economic sense of, of value, but um, yeah, just as a human being. And um, yeah, putting some some data to it. So I think I, I love the visualizing aspect that Clara has has brought up as well. And I think data is is a powerful tool in order to visualize um, the, the everyone's contribution that we have to the society and also to the economy. Um, and and I'm totally with you, Kate, with with that <laughs> balance of business case um, versus uh, it's a it's human rights, plain, uh, simple, um, but uh, yeah, someone, sometimes it's, it's worthwhile speaking um, someone's other languages to, to convince them and, and to push for, for things that you want to achieve. So, so happy you were all here and, and you spent um, the time with us. Um, I would love to um, share again the, the website of DCED with um, a lot of resources um, on, on, on the website. Of course, most <laughs> the most important resources are on the Women's Economic Empowerment page, obviously, um, but DCED has also a lot more to share um, um, beyond Women's Economic Empowerment, but you will find also the um, this um, research that we just talked about also there. Um, and I think there should also be a link to, to the podcast. Um, and that's my, my second um, recommendation that everyone listening to, to this webinar, um, you really need to listen in to We Talks, um, where you can um, hear again from voices from the field and then you hear Kate and Leva talking to, to people on the ground and how they um, were impacted of the COVID-19 pandemic. So, and last but not least, I would like to thank Ella and Jim from the DCD Secretariat. Um, they're a big help in the background. You probably all didn't see them, but um, without them, it wouldn't have been possible to organize all this. So thanks um, to you for your great support as always. So yeah. 
with that, um, I wish you all a, a very good day, um, evening, afternoon, wherever you tune in and um, build back better. <laughs> Take care. Bye.